Hello, here we are at Lesson 7, and I would like to talk for a little while about modals. Notice that I, I didn't say modal verbs. They're commonly known as no modal verbs, of course, but I'm going to say that they, in fact, are not verbs at all. They're so different. There are four basic differences, I think, between verbs um, and modals from a grammatical point of view. One, all the verbs in the English language have an infinitive, of course. So, to eat, to go, to wish. But we can't say to can, to will. We all know that. They have no infinitive form. Second, they cannot exist alone. They have to be followed by a verb. We can't say he must table. It has to be a verb because there must be a verb in every sentence. A finite verb in every sentence. And the modals cannot exist in a sentence without a verb. And the modal, from my point of view, is not a verb. Three. Do they have a third person present? That is the end of the verb in S. Mary goes. No, we of course can't say Jack wills, Jack cans, they have no third person. That's point three. Point four, every verb in the English language be used in the imperative form, but not modals. We can't say will eat, must eat. It's not like, sit down, eat up, at all. And so there are four grammatical reasons why modals should really not be considered as verbs. We shouldn't call them modal verbs, simply modals. And of course, modals is appropriate because mood, attitude, feeling. When we drop the modal into the sentence, before the verb, we're expressing our attitude towards the state of the world in some way. Our attitude towards that relationship between the subject and whatever follows the verb. Our feelings about it. Like, do we think it's possible or not? How possible do we think it is? May, might, could, be, must. Will. Certainty. So they have a very special and, shall we say, human function. They are the most personal of the words in the language. They express our personal feeling about the truth or non-truth or level of truth, shall we say, about the statement. Wonderful. Every language, of course, can do that, I imagine. I don't know every language of the world. Um, but, um, but English does it with these little words, modals. So we have will, would. We're really certain about things. We have shall, should, that certainty with that tinge of obligation. Hmm? Can, could. Can, which is probably the most objective report modal that we have. You know, if you can do it, this is sort of, we think there's no question about it. And then the states of the world that we can question may, might, it might be true, it may be true, he might be going, she might finish her dinner, who knows? Must. 
must. You can only feel must in the present, can't you? It's so strong, you know, you feel it in the present. But when we're talking about the past, when we're reporting the past, we have to change must to had to. It won't go. It won't go in the past must. It'll only be present to the future because we feel it and we feel the certainty of something or the great obligation of something at the moment that we speak. When we report it part in the past, where's all that certainty and obligation felt? It's reported. Had to. One would expect then that these words to be so important in everyday speech, and of course we all know that they are, that when we teach them, though, we, we, we teach them quite late, basically. We usually begin with can, the most objective of them, and then it's followed by um, perhaps have to and may, might. But students very often have to wait quite a long time because they are, before they're given the tools to express what they feel about the state of the world. So there must be something to look at there. Hmm? Um, and then, okay, if we look at the way in which Shakespeare uses the modals, they occur at the most dramatic moments in Shakespeare. He uses them to such effect as one would expect. For example, think of Coriolanus. Um, the moment when Coriolanus's friends are trying to get him to speak to the populace in such a way as to, um, to, to get their favour. And uh, Coriolanus's mother comes in with, he must and will. Prithee now say you will and go about it. The typical mother talking to her child. And, and Coriolanus responds, must I go show them my unbarbed sconce? Must I, with my base tongue, give to my noble heart a lie that it must hear? Well, I will do it. Yeah, I will do it. Okay. He reassures his mother. Huh? And think of Lady Macbeth, I mean, that famous complicated wood woodst speech, yeah? talking to um, Macbeth, of course. Who, who else does she talk to? Um, what thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glums, that which cries, thus thou must do, if thou have it. And that which rather thou dost fear to do, thou wishes should be undone. The effect of all those shades of attitudes, meanings there expressed by the modals. We certainly wouldn't be able to do without them. We could do without, without a word like table. We could, uh, we could replace it with something else. But those words which express our attitudes towards the state of the world, we can't do without at all. So, I think modals are not verbs. They're not verbs for four grammatical reasons. They have no infinitive. They have no third person S in the present tense. Um, they... Um, cannot be used in the infinitives structure, and they need to be followed by a verb because they are not verbs. They are expressions of our feelings about what the verb does in linking the subject to whatever follows the verb. What we think about the truth non-truth, shades of whether it's truth or not, not the state of the world. See you in lesson eight.